I am still a work in progress and facing myself each morning with something kind is still a challenge. Um, but I try every day to do as I say in the book, um, greet myself with a positive message. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really a, a shame that so many of us, particularly women, that we have a hard time just sort of looking at our own image and not tearing it apart and figuring out what's wrong. Um, but I think that that's at the core of some of our unease and unhappiness because if we don't start out by learning to love ourselves as we are, it's hard to, to pass that on to, to others. Um, so I, I am working on it every single day. So what was the thing you said today that was kind to yourself? What have I said? I, I've said, I love the jacket I'm wearing. I'm with you. I started there. I like what I'm wearing today. I think I look cute. <laughs> I'm not going to disagree. You know, it's so interesting <laughs> because don't. you are seen as a powerhouse. Okay, you're seen as this confident woman, this established woman, this smart woman. So I, I don't understand how it squares with what you describe as your fearful mind. You say you've lived with it for 58 years, and you say, which, and I quote, hates how I look all the time and no matter what. I'll be honest with you, if you're feeling like this, what hope do the rest of us have? <laughs> well, I think that's the point of sharing it. Um, we all have those thoughts, those negative thoughts that you know we've lived with for years, uh, especially as, as women and as women of color. Uh, where we don't see ourselves reflected in our society. I think we're in a better position, but one of the things I talked about was um, what it was like growing up, not just as a black woman, but as a tall black woman, uh, before the Serena and Venus years, before we had the WNBA, that we had role models other than gymnasts to, to look up to. Um, it is important for us to see who we can be uh, in order to, to, to feel, feel good about ourselves. But fear is also the, the, the ability to decode the fear that naturally arises in all of us, I've learned is a critical tool to have because fear is a powerful emotion. Um, it can keep us safe, but it can also keep us stuck. Uh, and that is something that so many of us find that we're in as we read signals as fear as a reason to step back and away from something rather than leaning in and getting comfortable in the jolt that comes with trying something new. Uh, so I, I, I share how important it is in, in the book to learn how to master that thing because if you can master your fear, if you can become comfortably afraid, uh, be afraid of the things that can actually cause you danger, but be open to the things that can uh, push you forward, that there's real power, powerful growth on the other side of that feeling of fear. And I can say now that everything that I am today is the result of me pushing past my, my comfort zone. Um, quieting my fearful mind and taking on that challenge that might have otherwise held me back. I, I, I am. I, I think, you know, to take a moment to talk about the man that I love, I think that Barack was a um, consequential leader. Um, I think, you know, for so many young people, not just here in America, but around the world, they grew up knowing only a black president of an African-American family in the White House. They saw themselves in the one, one of the most powerful positions on earth. Um, if you just count that alone, not to mention all of his accomplishments uh, from a policy perspective, it was absolutely worth taking that leap of faith. Um, but that's why I share that story. Um, I want people to sit with how fear can catch us up because I had to work through what was keeping, what was, what would have kept me from saying yes. And what it was, was me not wanting to change, not wanting to change my life, going to a new city, doing something I didn't know, making new friends, trying something hard. Um, but I had to unpack that and realize that we had the tools 
to get through all of that. We had done it before. We were practiced in it. I didn't want to share that 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 type of doubt with my girls. I had to think about the story I wanted them to tell about our family, and I didn't want to be at the core of it and have them say, my father could have been president of the United States, but we didn't do it because my mother was afraid. I didn't want to tell that story. I lived through the legacy of too many people, particularly African-American people, my grandfathers included, whose lives were constricted by their fear of, of something different. One of your grandfathers actually became very ill because of his fear of seeing a doctor or a dentist. That, that is one of the, that, that's the flip side of letting fear keep your world small and stuck. Uh, my grandfathers grew up in a generation of Jim Crow and segregation, and there were real fears in that. A black man showing up in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time, in the wrong place, looking the wrong way, could mean his death. Um, so with each passing year, I, I feel like my grandfather's world got smaller and smaller and smaller, both of them, to the point where they didn't trust anyone that, that they didn't know, um, not even doctors. Uh, and that, you know, with one of my grandparents led him to miss a diagnosis of, of lung cancer. So I use that as an example of how so many of us are locked in our sameness afraid to uh, meet or understand anyone that doesn't look like us, feel like us, agree with us, um, that keeps our world small and it, and it makes us susceptible to disinformation, conspiracy theories, all that we are confronted with. We start to fear anyone who's not like us. That's not a healthy place. Um, so I want young people in particular to think about that jolt of fear when they're confronted with it, to be able to distinguish between the fear, again, that's gonna keep them safe and the, the fear that's gonna keep them stuck in a small world. And interestingly, I'd be keen to know who you lent on when it comes to friends, when it comes to the tools you learned about. Because you compare the campaign for running for president as an evil Knievel motorcycle <laughs> stunt, a bike flying through the air. <laughs> so what did you use, who did you use when it felt that you were unseated? You know, this is where adaptability and practice uh, and being surrounded by a supportive community, uh, you know, helped a lot. Uh, we had a, a, a very competent campaign team, um, uh, top advisors. You know, I had a mother who stepped in when needed to be that extra foundation of support for our family, my brother, my girlfriends. I mean, that's why building that big, strong kitchen table is so important, um, to have those resources, the people that serve as your safety net, particularly if you're on a high-flying motorcycle uh, that is a, a presidential campaign. <laughs> It's interesting because I wonder what your state of mind was like during that hectic, intense time. Because you've said in, in the book that if you had a stray thought, an unresolved hurt, an uncategorized feeling, you'd put it on a distant mental shelf and you'd figure, you know, I'll come back to it later during a less busy time. Well, that was an immensely, intensely busy time. And I just wonder, have you ever gone back to that shelf and have you cleared it? And what was that like? Well, those shelves in our lives never get completely cleared. Um, but this, but I have done a lot of revisiting. Um, and as I, I write in the book, uh, this quarantine period, this long period of isolation for me, uh, what that forced stillness we were all uh, subjected to forced me to sit in my quietness because I didn't have busy as a, a defense mechanism. I didn't have the distractions of busy. And let me qualify that, that by saying, and I was lucky because I was in an income bracket where uh, we had a stable home, where we were not essential workers, where we weren't a part of the community of people who had to put their lives at risk to help save us all. So I'm not complaining, but I'm saying that that was probably the first time in most of my adult life where I couldn't be busy any longer and I had to sit in my own thoughts 
and sort through, how did I get here? What does this all mean? How did our country, our world get into the mess that we're in? Um, and my book, this current book, The Light We Carry, was the product of that stewing, that unwinding and unwrapping and trying to make sense of it all. Um, so this book is a product of my not busyness, <laughs> the, the unpacking of those, those worries and thoughts that I, I, I put on a shelf for most of my life. You talk about visibility and you talk about the importance of being seen and about many minority groups which are not seen still. And you say we need to stay aware of whose stories are being told and whose are being erased. Who at this moment in time do you think isn't being seen? I, you know, the, the irony is, is I think there are more and more people who feel like they don't matter on this planet, you know, and, and I, I talk about what it feels like to be different. You know, I, I, I open up the book by talking about difference and how it, de it, it defines so much about how we see one another and how we see the world. But you'll notice that I also define difference very broadly. It is not just race and gender, but it's, it's, it's economic status. It's whether you live in the city or in, on a farm. It's how you learn, how you love, how you feel. There's so many of us who feel marginalized. And that's a curious thing that we, you know, because, you know, we live in such a complicated planet that so many of us don't feel seen. Um, I'm trying to express my view of what differentness feels like, um, but I think that, uh, that that's where the work happens. We cannot wait for other people to see us because some of the people that we think see us feel marginalized themselves. They don't feel seen or heard. So we have to start from within. You know, I, I start the, the first question you asked about starting con. It's like, if, if I'm waiting for somebody else to tell me that I matter, that I look good, that I'm okay, I could be waiting a long time. Not because they don't believe it, but they're, but they're focused on their survival. They're focused on their own personal journey. Uh, we can't wait around for one another to see us. The, first, the work we have to do first is seeing ourselves. That message of positivity was one that you and your husband, Barack, took on the campaign trail. Kindness, being seen, people counting. What have you taken from the fact that the US electorate decided to replace Barack Obama with Donald Trump? In the book, you say, it still hurts. Mm -hmm. Does it? It And it still hurts. Um, but that's that point in time when you have to ask yourself, was it worth it? Um, did we make a dent? Um, did it matter? Uh, and when I'm in my darkest moment, right, my most irrational place, I could say, well, maybe not. Maybe we weren't good enough. Um, but then I look around and I, I you know, when, when there is more clarity, when I'm able to unpack those feelings and think more rationally, I think, well, my gosh, as I said earlier today, there are, there's a whole world of young people who are thinking differently about themselves because uh, of, of the work that we've done. Um, and that's where, you, you know, you can't allow great to be the enemy of the good. You know, did everything get fixed in the eight years that we were there? Absolutely not. That's not how change happens. But we laid a marker in the sand. We pushed the wheel forward a bit. But progress isn't about a steady climb upward. There are ups and downs and stagnation. That's the, the nature of change. And that's why the work that we're doing today is about empowering the next generation, the generation that we're handing the baton over to and making space for them to make their mark on history.